it's the intersection of big data, data security, and data privacy. And Anyone today who is doing massive amounts of data and analytics is aware of the fact that I now have to make sure that I protect that data. The problem is complex to solve, and we know it requires everybody in the organization across all functions and work on it together. How do you navigate that within a company? It's an important conversation. And we are live. Fantastic. Um, good afternoon, everybody. So my name is Elena Lihashkina, and I'm going to be your host for the rest of the day for the sessions of the global uh, track number seven. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, so we continue our discussions and related to really important data topics. So the first topic on, on afternoon um, is going to be about the data protection and uh, regulations in, a, in the area of um, artificial intelligence. So many of you have been observing the trends, how artificial intelligence is, not, is now taking over across many industries and across many business um, functions and the government. So today we have um, experts who are joining us. Um, so we have Bess and Paul, um, they're gonna introduce themselves in a second, uh, who is gonna share with us uh, what is happening uh, from the data protection and uh, regulatory trends, um, including some recent regulations which are coming from White House and um, other government organizations. So Paul and Bess, um, thank you so much. Um, welcome, and um, the floor is all yours. Uh, thank you so much, Elena, and we really appreciate everyone, uh, their time, your time today and being able to stop by and uh, share some thoughts. Uh, it, these are active thoughts because we're on a journey. So if you read the summary of today's, the abstract of today's talk, we're really going to double click a bit more on um, the journey that we, we see as it relates to um, defense, regulation, increasing threats and how all that pivots around how agencies will view um, the use of artificial intelligence. But before we dive into that discussion, I want to turn to my colleague here, Paul Montrose, and thank him for joining me today. And we'll start off with some introductions. So I'll turn over to you, Paul. Thank you, Beth Ann. And as Beth Ann mentioned, my name is Paul Montrose. I'm a senior director and deputy chief security officer here at Axiom. I have been at Axiom about 25 years. I've spent a little over 30 years of my career in the IT industry, a little over 19 years of my career in cybersecurity. Beth Ann, back to you. Oh, thanks. And I work with Paul here at Axiom as a Chief Security and Compliance Officer. And I'm bringing to the conversation today 26 years in IT, spanning across multiple domains in the information security sector and it worked primarily in um, the biotech, healthcare, uh, tech, and consumer products, goods, industries. So we're going to start this journey and double click. Before we do, we just want to do a little bit of a shout out and thanks to our legal partners. We collaborate with a lot of thought leaders in the privacy and legal space on this particular topic. Our focus today is a cyber defense. And so we're gonna dive in now and take a look at um, our journey, the convergence between cyber defense, uh, automation, digital acceleration and regulation, what we see across multiple conversations as it relates to supply chain concerns. And then we'll come back around for the final stretch to see how this is all wrapping up into uh, the discussion around regulation and expectations of us, right? So all of the conversations from a regulatory lens is really uh, underpinning expectations on how we um, navigate uh, a security and privacy posture. So let's start off with the journey. 
When we double click and look at the use of AI, I just want to make sure we're level setting. Our approach today is to have a conversation from these general definitions, right? Artificial intelligence at the end of the day is the use of mathematics uh, and um, automated capabilities to quantify massive amounts of data for supportive decision making outcomes. And the reason why starting with that definition is important because when we talk about um, data protection and the expectations around the protection, especially the business logic that underlies a lot of our algorithmic processing, uh, you can't defend that uh, posture or that the structure, the underlying uh, structure of that if we're not looking at it from a code perspective. And that's the premise of our conversation today is that the ability to balance data protection, artificial intelligence, and the integrity of that, this in the logic and the intelligence there, and then how we begin to position ourselves for a regulatory outcome, um, those are all connected. These are not separate worlds anymore. They are all, um, the handshake between those worlds are really important. Our hope for you today, um, whether or not you're coming to this conversation from the privacy lens, the legal lens, security lens, or tech technology lens, is that you're able to walk away from this talk with some additional insights that you would share with your colleagues at the table when you return to your place of employment. Uh, because what we see is that the ability to transform and integrate uh, across privacy, across security, across tech, across digital, across uh, data science, those are all heavily dependent upon each other. So let's take a look at the journey. So I don't know if you've had an opportunity to read Pentagon's Brain. I think Annie Jacobson did a fantastic job um, summarizing the evolution and the journey from the point of origin uh, where we see the um, the birth of um, our capabilities on the internet uh, and to where we are now, right? And so that journey started from a place of trust. And I think it's uh, interesting that we're meeting here today with support from um, our university um, at MIT. You know, that place of trust was the purpose to share information. And as we advanced uh, across the use of this technology and what we see now is a more accelerated explosion of di digital expansion, we, we learned that we needed to create uh, solutions that were trusting solutions. But as we evolved over the years, the role of security was not, um, I don't know, emphasized in a way that embedded security and security by design in our construct and in our approach to develop uh, software or coding. And here we are fast forward to today. And um, if you haven't had a chance to read Nicole Pearl, uh, Pearl Roth's book, I think that's a very interesting read. We're at a place where user experience is paramount. It's almost like you could swap user experience for trust uh, from that starting point when we look at DARPA. But user experience is so paramount and what we need to incorporate and embed into that thought process is that security by design um, and, and, and security enablement as we design seamless user experience is paramount for uh, foundation to a trusted um, and repeatable artificial intelligence capability. Now, when we look forward uh, facing and we look at uh, informed intelligence, which the AI um, component builds out in our construct, if we start to uh, leverage security by design and security based principles in our user experience, we'll be able to, what we presume and present to you, is that we would be able to close the gap between where regulatory agencies uh, are voicing concern the approach with which artificial intelligence is used uh, and designed so that it's consistent, and then what we're seeing from a cyber attack perspective as it relates to leveraging weaknesses behind the code which actually supports the, the processing of intelligence. So why is this important now? That was sort of a, a foundational component for the discussion. Let me turn to Paul and you could take us through what we're seeing in the trends from a cybersecurity perspective and why this, the, 
the data protection and cyber defense are integrated conversations right now. Thank you, Beth Ann. What we're seeing as trends are, as Beth Ann mentioned, they're getting more sophisticated. In the past, we used to see a vulnerability be exploited for the betterment of the organized crime or nation state, whatever. Now we're seeing not just a single vulnerability, but we're seeing misconfiguration or vulnerability stacking where <clears throat> the adversaries are now taking uh, smaller vulnerabilities, exploiting them individually and getting to their end result. So where one vulnerability on its own may not be a problem, stacking them together now gives them an exploitable environment. We're also seeing more sophisticated attack vectors, such as now using the supply chain attacks, which we'll talk about now, which is more of an inside uh, type attack rather than a traditional uh, border on your network. Um, as uh, mentioned in the slides, 62% uh, uh, of attacks were malware free. So they're, again, they're going after vulnerability. Uh, average e-crime takes about an hour and 38 minutes of breakout time and so on. Um, 80 there was an 82% increase in ransomware related data leaks. Uh, and some of the, that's some of the high points from the slide. Beth Ann, did I miss anything? You know, I, I think the call out around the 62% of the attacks uh, were malware free is an amazing metric when we start to talk about the ability to demonstrate integrity and consistency in the use of intelligence in our systems. The fact that actors are now, I always, I forgot where I heard this, but you know, the, the actors are able to have single focus, right? They understand the architecture and they're able to leverage the architecture in a way against uh, organizations because they're single focused. They have the ability to stay focused on um, analyzing the vulnerabilities and then creating custom scripts or codes to, to maximize the weakness in those vulnerabilities. So I think that 62% is an amazing metric considering where we were uh, over the past two years um, looking at uh, vehicles uh, that were used to compromise organizations independent of the source of the actor. So I think that's a, a really strong um, metric there for us to uh, put a pin in that for our conversation going forward. Paul, were there other aspects we wanted to highlight here? You know what I think is interesting, building on what we were talking about, Beth Ann, in a little while here, we're going to be talking about the regulations that are going to be governing you know, AI, the, to your point about the scripts and so on that our adversaries are writing, they're not governed by those regulations. We, on the other hand, in defending ourselves, uh, whether it's a, a government, a company, or, or we are governed by those regulations. And we need to keep that in mind as we're looking at this, the bad guys are not. For sure. So, as we connect the dots between the evolving need to demonstrate strong data protection, we see that the method and the approach with which the actors are leveraging weaknesses and vulnerabilities to undermine that integrity. And then we are going to pivot now and talk a little bit about what I you know, mentioned earlier is that when we design solutions, whether it's a product, an application, or a service, it's, it's our approach to ensure defensible code and then test that defensible structure in light of where we are in the threat landscape that helps us support a conversation around regulation and how do we govern ourselves. At the end of the day, we are still accountable to demonstrate what the CIA, right? Confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And the components of those CIA um, components underneath an artificial intelligence solution or uh, automated solution uh, comes down to how we build, how we test, and we're evolving that to run at the pace and change of our digital solutions. So we mentioned so far, um, security by design is privacy by design. 
And if we look at uh, the methods with which we're training our uh, next generation um, developers, our next generation thought leaders, we, uh, we're, our position is that it's so important to integrate the, the, uh, the usefulness of security by design with usability because they will be synony synonymous. So Paul, do you want to take us through some pillars here that are important when we're talking about building out a robust supply chain or integrated software solution? Sure, Kim, Beth Ann. One of the things that needs to be remembered is when we're dealing with artificial intelligence, traditionally in cybersecurity, we would shore up and defend our development environment adequately but we would be concentrating on defending from the, the malware, the, the attackers. When we're talking an AI environment, we need to also, and as you will see in subsequent slides as we get into, make sure that the environment in which the development occurs is also uh, has enough security controls in place to protect that development as, of AI that that is not accessed in an unauthorized manner and the AI you're writing is now poisoned and used in an unattended manner. So what we look at is defensive architecture, both again, while during the development and after it's in production. We wanna make sure that the mindset is integrated into design as we're doing the development, that the appropriate gates are in place to do the AI checks and so on that we have the appropriate defense and depth in place, firewalls, web application firewalls, also the shift left mentality as we're doing the development of whatever the code may be, training the employees to understand that shift mentality to deploy secure coding the first time and not doing the rework after scanning is done later on, integrate into the, the uh, automated uh, policy by design with the checks and the logs. Another thing that has become popular that wasn't popular before is network segmentation. More companies move to more flatter networks to make life easier. Uh, as Beth Ann mentioned before, now segmentation as you'll hear becomes more and more uh, important. And lastly, detection and be able to respond quickly. Beth Ann, did I miss anything? No, I, I think your your foundational pieces here are, are important, um, and, and it it's the underlying support of the integrity of the code that supports how we rely on um, our, the intelligence. Whether that artificial intelligence is empowering advanced compute or advanced thought process or supporting um, just the automation of operational activities, which we're gonna talk about in a few minutes here as we look at uh, evolving supply chain compromise issues. But there's a concept, again, that underlies our security by design discussion, which is fit for use. And, and, and blending the, the ability to demonstrate fit for use, I designed a solution, it's coded the way it should be, you know, should be coded. It's tested to validate the integrity of um, how the intelligence is supposed to work. And then the business logic behind that intelligence has been tested and actually attacked, right? When we do our penetration testing, we should attack the business logic to make sure that that logic can't be altered. It cannot be changed. And you should, you want to be able to test that if it does change, that your alerting capabilities routes back to your security operation center. So again, the concepts that we're describing here are key points for you if you are leading a data strategy or a data science and analytics strategy. These are key points that you would want to take to your security officer to make sure as you build out an integrated strategy together, that that security team is advancing in their understanding of how to support you. So we're gonna switch gears now and talk about how the growing concerns in the supply chain rolls back and again, could potentially impact our use of artificial intelligence that's embedded in solutions that we buy and integrate into our network or the build out of the solutions that includes intelligence. 
So Paul, I know you love this slide. Let's take it through. You know, if there was an AI talk, there was going to be a slide about, you know, the machines coming alive and attacking. Well, before we even had this talk, we had this slide about supply chain attacks. And as we move along here in our journey, you'll see why. But yes, this is one of my favorite slides. So let's get into a little bit and talk about this. So next slide, please, Beth. Thank you. So when we're talking about a defensible environment, especially when we're talking about AI development, as I previously mentioned, creating an environment where secure development can happen, that's where it needs to start. You do not need your code, whether it's AI or standard code, Java, whatever it may be, poison during development. So using the, whether you're working in the cloud, where you're working on premises, making sure that you have the right monitoring in place, that if you're using open source code, that you're scanning that code when it's coming in. Even, I think the last statistic that I heard was Microsoft Windows is 93% open source code, okay? That's a lot of open source, especially for a proprietary package. So, and open source communities have various levels of maintaining their their code. So making sure when you bring that into your environment, it's scanned and then monitored afterwards becomes exceedingly important. Also, as we're looking at enterprise services to make sure we don't have supply chain um, injections and also teach the updated methods as we were talked about earlier, we have about make sure you educate your developers and your staff on what are the attack vectors they need to know about? What is appropriate secure coding? And lastly, when we're looking at our data center, make sure your access points are configured correctly and so on. Now, if we start looking at the, the environment after our um, AI is developed, you started hearing a little while ago, is defense in depth gotten past A? Well, I'm here to say it's not. Because of the new uh, attack vectors we're seeing, sure, we're seeing the old ones of brute force attacks and using misconfiguration, but we're seeing new ones such as code poisoning, such as vulnerability stacking with misconfigurations. And then one you'll see in every single category here called supply chain attacks. The difference is, um, as we're about to see, a supply chain attack occurs within your network. So we have to build a resilient environment, being able to handle all of these situations. What we need to keep in mind too, as we're looking at, at an AI world, is there are scanning companies, cybersecurity companies that profess, they teach their AI uh, how to learn. No, you could go on to that next okay. slide too. How to learn. Uh, what to find in vulnerabilities by scanning open source repositories, which is really cool. That gives them a very large community in order to scan to find vulnerabilities. Well, the bad people are doing that also. They're also using their those repositories to use, have their AI scan those repositories and learn what type of vulnerabilities and misconfigurations go after. As you can see, we utilized Taylor and Francis online about the review about emerging threats of AI. Um, and you can see 56% of cyber attack techniques using AR are being used for access and penetration. And that becomes important as we're talking about our subsequent slides here. And really I wanna focus in on supply chain attack. What is a supply chain attack according to Wik Wikipedia? It's a cyber attack that seeks to damage the organization by targeting less security elements. Really, the, the first big one was solar winds, if you've heard about that. And that's where you had a trusted network monitoring tool, had malware injected into it by a, a nation state, and it came alive with inside your network and started attacking your infrastructure. And think about that. That was a network monitoring tool which means it had access to almost all of your network. So this, think about now the ramifications of a supply chain attack with AI, 
with AI based attack, meaning right now, the the current supply chain attacks do what the code tells them to do. If you now integrate AI into a supply chain attack and it's able to reason as it grows and understand your environment and a lot of, keep in mind, a lot of malware remains dormant until it understands enough about your environment to attack. So the AI can be on your network, understanding your network and learning and growing and then launch the attack when it's appropriate for, for you, for them. Did I miss anything, Beth Ann? No, I, I think Paul summarizing the method with which we develop to ensure the integrity of code that underlies artificial intelligence capability, the, the, the business logic, the intelligence logic. And then on the reverse side of that, understanding how uh, actors can leverage the, you know, as I mentioned earlier, they are single threaded, they are single focused, they understand architecture. This, this is for a business, right? There is an outcome and the outcome is additional revenue. The ability to leverage the power of intelligence that's automated is just as much of an opportunity for them as it is for us from a defense perspective. So, you know, again, this is designed to give ideas to then take back to your security teams and your leaders to collaborate on how you can fast forward. If you have your security teams testing, understanding this uh, strategy as it relates to data science and intelligence, uh, and they're building test capabilities that run in front of your um, solution, your design, or your products, it will help establish more of a frictionless ecosystem of your ability to launch products to market, the ability to collect information without interruption, and the ability to demonstrate uh, integrity of the code, of the product, of the service, which is expected of us from any kind of agency lens. So I think I think that's a great walkthrough, Paul, and I, and I, I I know our last slide here is just some recommendations around monitoring for supply chain compromises in, in respective organizations. One of the things I, I also want to add to while we're getting into this is we in the cybersecurity community and unfortunately in the nefarious community has done a lot of learning this year. What they we have found out is supply chain attacks work. We've also found out that there's economy of scale when you find open source components like Log4j, that is components of many applications, including open source and proprietary, that you can leverage as a payload for nefarious means. And what this means is, since these newer attack vectors have been found, they are going to be used to more weaponize as more contemporary uh, capabilities with artificial intelligence come around because the traditional defenses that we've talked about, about firewalls on the perimeter, just don't protect the bet around that. Log4j, solar winds, great examples of what we're seeing. So how do we uh, address issues that start with inside our network, like a supply chain attack or even a log4j? One, you want to stay informed with intelligence feeds. Um, there's free ones out there. Definitely keep your eye out quarantine and scan open source software. Have an effective third-party risk management program. That's not just with open source. That's even with your major suppliers like Microsoft, Oracle, whatever they may be. Make sure those providers have a li uh, liability insurance to your cyber liability insurance, which by the way is getting more expensive and harder to obtain nowadays. The other thing is, is definitely keep an eye on your vendors that don't have a direct line of sight on uh, software development. Like if a vending machine company comes in and says, I'd like to put a vending machine on your network. And you say, I mean, I'd like to put a vending machine in your facility and you say, sure. And then the next thing they ask you for is a network password so they could have the, uh, the uh, credit card processing go through your network. Well, you want to make sure that vending machine company is going to maintain that software if there's any vulnerabilities because you're the one that pays the price if they don't. 
getting into segmentation of networks for a while that was passe. Now it's become more critical to contain those internal type attacks. Restricting network access, internet access from your critical zones on your network. Solar Winds is a perfect example. The malware in Solar Winds came alive and it looked like it looked to see if it had internet access. If it did not, it went dormant and did not adversely affect the net the network it was on. If it did, it came alive and adversely affected the network it was on. Increase internal monitoring, aggressive, aggressive patching. And lastly, update your incident response plan. And you may have a template or messaging ready that if something bad happens, it's already pre-approved by legal, marketing, senior leadership, and so on. Because the last thing you want to do is scramble around writing documentation while you're trying to deal with a situation. Beth Ann, anything to add? No, I think those are great points. These are foundational components to organization as we're protecting and defending um, our automated capabilities uh, for sure. So when we take a look at um, the journey, so we've, we've talked about the journey, we've looked at you know, the, the relationship or similarly similarities between um, how we've advanced um, technical um, concerns into advanced digital platform, the focus of user experience, and the fact that we need to begin to advance the concept of user experience with security by design. Those two concepts, when they handshake together, you have a really robust package and you are always in a state of audit readiness. We provided some key talking points for you to take back to your security organization and have an active conversation around integrated strategies. So now we're going to take a quick right turn and take a look at some of the changes that are in uh, the regulatory uh, landscape, which always drives expectations around how we perform. Now, again, going back on a journey. The relationship between data protection, the expectation for publicly traded companies to always demonstrate integrity and confidentiality of data, and the pressure or the the growing um, concerns to be able to be audit ready and to show strong hygiene around the technology that is embedded behind our machines. Um, we saw a significant change in 2018 when Moody's first indicated the fact that publicly traded companies that don't take control of their cyber posture and their cyber and incident response programs could potentially impact the organization's credit score. Now, you, I, I'm a little bit older than I look. And I can tell you for sure, this was the first time you really saw some concrete relationship between uh, advancing strong security posture and the financial impact on publicly traded companies and subsequent the potential impact on stock, right? And, and, the, and the rating of the company. Uh, and that, and then as we watched Moody's throughout the years, it began to, um, integrate its strategy around risk and monitoring of companies and the, and the, the cybersecurity posture of those companies and acquired companies between 2018 all the way through last year in 2021, acquiring a number of risk-based companies. We know that um, from the uh, streets perspective, the ability to maintain and demonstrate resilience is paramount and it's gonna be part of what we are measured. We're also seeing this in our SEC metrics, right? So environmental, social, and, and um, governance metrics that um, from our January 2022 White House memorandum, where we saw the White House issue direction as it relates to software integrity, demonstrating the integrity of, of code that supports a majority of our infrastructure and then the ability to, uh, and the impact of that, you know, we're currently waiting for, for additional guidance from the SEC and the FTC. So these worlds are starting to collide. And that's the point I think we wanted to emphasize here. There's really no disconnect anymore between the privacy concept and the pillar underneath privacy as it relates to data protection. Your cyber defense program 
and the ability to demonstrate your, your solutions, your products are fit for use because you can repeatedly demonstrate how your code stays, stays in a state of resilience. And that is from persistent uh, penetration testing and integrity testing on that code. And that's the piece as publicly traded organizations, when we start to sit down and we listen to the concerns of regulatory, uh, of our regulatory bodies and um, different lawmakers in Washington, it rolls back to that conversation around code. We are defending our solutions and demonstrating the integrity of our solutions at the code level. So it's time for us as professionals, no matter what side of the lens where you sit, to begin to press on the um, on industries to integrate that secure code, um, resilient testing, and usability into one lens, especially as we're training our next generation thought leaders. So how we're tracking the concerns, I don't know if, if any of you have ever had a chance to hear Carol Provision, uh, managing partner at Inc. Law. She's a litigator uh, in Canada and there's a lot of legislation that's uh, uh, legislative reviews and new laws that have been passed uh, in Canada, in Europe, and coming uh, a lot of direction coming here in the U.S. So as we look at these growing concerns and how we're tracking them and how potentially it will impact the regulatory landscape, we know underneath all of those concerns um, is the need to be able to demonstrate consistent practice and good hygiene practice at the code level. Uh, and so if your organization starts to embed that now, especially as we see the uh, White House and senior leaders talking about requiring a software bill of materials, right? So that the SBOM, which is the acronym, um, start now, right? You know, making sure you have an inventory of your assets, inventory of the code, uh, you know, as Paul mentioned earlier, if you're ingesting and relying on public uh, open source code, having that right level of integrity. Because when we take a look at common, uh, common themes across different countries, it's really that integrity defense uh, of our software uh, that we will see um, outlined in all of these standards, right? So in the US, we see quite a lot of those standards being drafted either by uh, the NIST organization. As I mentioned, we're waiting for FTC guidance to release as it relates to the May 2021 uh, executive order and the January memorandum that was issued this year. Uh, and then there's quite a number of other bills that are in, in discussion. At the heart of all this is an underlying discussion as it relates to how do we protect the values, um, however those values are set by a community or a regional body, and then the fairness of how those algorithms are operating and the ability to ensure that the algorithms are not um, being influenced um, by some kind of um, um, driver or insight. Again, that all starts at the code level. So the practice of ensuring um, secure software development that is designed to demonstrate fit for use at all time is at the heart of what we anticipate seeing behind these government standards and new regulatory expectations. And this is a, this is a tweak, right? Having your organization shift from identifying vulnerabilities and ensuring code, to Paul's point, uh, at the end of a network scan and pulling that all the way to the left so that you're embedding that thought process and the practice as they're coding and as they're developing is how it will help your organization get in front of what will come here with these new standards. Uh, and it will make sure that your company is audit ready um, with these new guidelines. So I think that's what we have today. Oh, I, I do have one other point. When we look at all of the drivers in a digital landscape and the relationships between the companies as, as we're either advancing um, the ability to maximize data, 
Uh, so if you're a chief data officer and you're driving uh, new solutions for your company, partnering with your security organization so that they can run in front of you. Security um, across all of the, the, you know, the connected partners, it becomes an enabler. So security enables a frictionless ecosystem. And so in order to uh, create that frictionless ecosystem, I'm using this visual here, it's the balance as we've been talking through our discussion today. So it's the balance between usability, agility, the protection of data, and then automate the, automate the heck out of the policies. So by design, your solutions are audit ready. Did I miss anything, Paul? No, I, I think we you've done a really good job of, um, of addressing this. I think really when, when we sum it up, traditionally a lot of companies looked at the life cycle of a product once they deployed it in production. And now as we look at product security, the life cycle starts during ideation. And that's where the security needs to start because you do not want an application that you have developed to become a payload for bad actors to use to deploy their artificial intelligence or just basic code into somebody else's network. Have we already seen through the court rulings from cellular wins, you will be held liable for uh, reparations for the companies that will be affected. So in the age that we're seeing now with new attack vectors that are from the inside of the network, and weaponizing those more with more intelligent capabilities, such as artificial intelligence, the need to have a 360 degree view of your product security from the beginning of the life cycle all the way to the end, especially during development that your code is not poisoned, becomes exceedingly important and becomes, uh, and we're sure will change even more as uh, time goes on and we'll find new attack vectors. For sure. So that concludes our talk today. Uh, hopefully that's helpful for you, depending upon, again, your lens. If you are a chief data officer, this gives you some uh, points that, uh, salient points that you would want to review with your security partner at the table to help drive um, forward looking um, strategies. Elena, do we have any questions so far? Yeah, yes, absolutely. We do have questions. So I can start maybe from the first one. So let me bring the first question. Um, so I think the first question came um, in terms of the, when we train the model itself, right? So because you're saying that um, we need a security by design, right? But when we do the the training of the model, is it possible that um, we can also do our own training so we can actually add uh, some errors and add some um, not good behaviors during the training? So any yeah. comments on this? I think that's a fantastic question. And I'm gonna answer the question in a more, in a broader sense, um, because there's quite a bit of logic behind that question that we, we could talk for hours on that. but. I love where you're going with that question. The ability to automate the policy. So when we go back a couple generations in our software development practice, and we started to see companies create uh, traditional general computing controls, and they began to automate those controls and embed the you know first generation automated controls, and then you got into your second, third. So where we are today. And I don't know if, if you believe in self-healing or not, but if we um, ensure that we embed, um, to your point, uh, as it begins to learn, um, the policies that we need to have intact to uh, ensure that the intelligence can understand error or adjustment or when it's being compromised, I think that's the direction um, that we would need to, um, you know, continue to implement as we're developing more advanced artificial intelligence capability. I think even as we do that, however, we still have to have in place a methodology to determine if that um, learning 
um, and the evolution of the learning starts to be compromised, right? So there's just always this balance and check between where the logic, uh, how we uh, inform the logic, and then checking to make sure the pureness of that informed direction is not compromised. And again, that's always at the code level. So I hopefully um, I answered your question and hopefully I understood the question. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so another question we get because you um, definitely, it was interesting learning for me to learn that um, how much people using an open code, right? More than 90%, it's, it's quite a lot, right? Um, and you provided um, a lot of context in terms of how you select your third party partners. So the question we have uh, from the audience that um, despite of this all governance, which people put in place for the third party partners, uh, we're still seeing that, for example, like a solar winds actually hitting so many people. Um, so does this mean that the third parties, um, not programs are not really robust? <coughs> uh, or what, what are other aspects could be impacting that we still see a lot of um, breakages happening? Well, I'll tell you, these are great questions. Um, you know, the traditional method of evaluating third party is based on a lot of uh, certifications uh, and approach, you know, to question an organization about its security posture. Um, those are good questions, but to Paul's point, we are defending at the code level now. Uh, and so the questions that we have to evaluate our third party has to include a balance of hygiene, right? How do you manage defects? How often do you allow uh, defects to sit on your backlog? Uh, what's the escalation process to manage uh, vulnerabilities or defects that age, right? These are hygiene questions that will indicate how a third party manages the code that your company is ingesting. The other thing to keep in mind, <coughs> excuse me, is that when you're signing contracts with third parties, you want to make sure you're updating those contract terms to permit you to have the right to audit if you begin to uh, uh, sense that the software or the code is not being managed correctly, right? Um, so, so that, that's, that's my, you know, that's a suggestion around, uh, evolving the third party risk assessment process, because at this time it's really about, you know, not the ability to pass a certification. It's about how well are you taking care of the hygiene? Paul, I know you've got a lot of thoughts on this. What are your thoughts? No, I think you hit, uh, some very good points when you're talking to a, a vendor. But let's take a little bit of shift on that. What happens if there is no vendor, such as the open source community? And as economic times are getting a little bit more difficult, and I've been talking to colleagues and peers out there, more and more companies are looking at open source solutions because it's supposed to be relatively less expensive to deploy in their network. And I'm not just talking about adding to their code. I mean, deploying a solution an open source solution rather than a proprietary solution. In that case, there's generally no contract to sign, no throat to choke. If something goes wrong, it's all on you. That's where you also have to have the uh, processes in place to scan the code, monitor updates, monitor that you're getting the correct code. Keep in mind, there are also nefarious mirrored sites out there for legitimate open source sites. So you've got to make sure that your uh, company is actually getting its open source from the correct site and not from a mirrored site that has poison code. Again, that's how they get inside your network. So I think Beth Ann hit the topic real well when you're talking to a company, but a lot of, com a lot of companies now are using open source solutions. So we also have to adjust for that within our company scan, quarantine, and monitor. Thanks, thanks, Paul. Elena, do we have another question? Uh, yes, I have one more question and I hope I understood it correctly. Um, so the question about um, data privacy policy um, and um, how we should be um, 
evaluating the performance of this policy. Uh, so if we have a different um, market market settings, basically in the free market settings, is it really necessary to do this evaluation? Um, or there are flexibility, right? Because I think it's a balance between being defensive and being offensive, right? So how you can um, keep up this balance? Yeah, I, I like that question. Um, so today's talk focused a lot on the role of data protection, which is a component under privacy. And um, I, I think, I think when we mention shifting left to ensure that we're automating or building into solutions, the right level of defensibility, code integrity, um, it, the automation of the, of the policy, you start to have that proactive approach to designing solutions so that we are ahead of what is expected of us from a privacy perspective. I think uh, when we talk about responding to attacks um, from an actor's perspective, that's obviously the reactive side. Um, but um, independent of how uh, government agencies evolve the privacy practice, underneath all of that discussion is the expectation of a company to demonstrate the protection of the data the ability to um, demonstrate appropriate values that a country may have, right? So when we get these regulatory requirements, it really is, an, it embodies the values of that country. Um, underneath there, there's an expectation to protect the data, to be able to recall, um, meaning, uh, you know, when an individual owns the right to their data. Um, and, and the ability to um, always have true line of sight into the inventory of the data. So there's, there's these underlying components uh, that support the privacy conversation um, that from a proactive perspective, companies just would have to keep that as an active automated approach independent of where regulatory direction goes. Hopefully I understood the question and answered the question um, Paul, do you have any other thoughts here? I think you covered it well, Beth Ann. Oh, okay. I hope I did. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, Beth and Paul. I don't see any additional comments to this question, so hopefully, hopefully we answered it. Okay. Um, so yeah, so we have a um, couple minutes left, like five minutes left. Um, I don't have other questions, but we maybe I'll ask my my own questions. Oh, for uh, sure. So yeah, uh, de definitely going into um, the open source. Um, looking from the business perspective, I, I do understand why people rely on an open source. Um, I mean, first of all, it's a new area. There are so much new development happening, right? So people would love to get a quick win um, and um, they're looking for opportunities. Um, do you see any potential uh, more like a government uh, type of a, um, regulations coming to this way? Um, and uh, maybe not in US, maybe outside of US. So is it any discussions are happening how to regulate the open source um, or at least uh, to protect the open source, right? So then people don't feel the, the threat is happening. And now you, you do see that. Um, Paul, do you want to, um, I, I can share what I'm seeing. I don't know if you want to go first or. Um, I do go ahead and go first because I'm really not seeing much as in regulations with open source. I'm really seeing more of the back end that companies are more doing more scanning, more self-regulation as to what they will bring into their companies. And then you're also, um, you know, I've been reading some articles lately that the cybersecurity providers are getting a little bit more activist to where instead of just asking for uh, asking questions through a questionnaire that they're going to want evidence. And you may see the cybersecurity providers uh, start providing that type of regulation because they will or will not insure a company uh, based on how much open source they may use and so on. I'm not saying it's, it's happening. I'm saying it's, it's a possibility because we are not seeing regulations coming out of the regulatory entities like the governments and so on. Beth Ann? Uh, yeah. 
Yeah, I, I think what you know what what we're what I'm seeing is um, the individual organizations they are they are trying to um, self uh, govern uh, and mm-hmm. get ahead of what I would call <laughs> good hygiene standards, right? Um, the and and, and t- tangential to that, to Paul's point, you know, we see NIST and a couple of revisions to uh, the NIST guidance. Um, still heavy on the um, sort of GRC governance side versus being more specific in the hygiene side. Um, So I think if I had a wand, a magic wand, and I would have, you know, the the world was my own, I would sort of ask uh, that we spend more time on issuing standards that help indicate the health from a hygiene perspective, because that's where you win the battle, right? Um, but from an open source perspective, you know, we are seeing these independent, uh, communities try to, um, improve and advance the practice. But, uh, I, I think you're, I think we, I will see some more, um, heavier government intervention if we experience another large supply chain, supply chain attack, right? Um, what is the term? You never let a crisis go to waste. So um, I think you would see more intervention on the uh, use of hygiene um, and, and if that were to occur again. I think that's a real valid point, Bethann. I mean, when we look at Log4j, here's an com- open source component that is embedded so, embedded so deep within many proprietary as well as open source applications that Um, And the exploit was so easy to take advantage of, but yet so hard to find, taught the nefarious community that they could have an economy of scale with a small little open source module like that. But then to your point, it made it all the way to the White House uh, and to the stock markets about this little module called called Log4J because it caused so many problems in the community and is still causing problems to this day, even though it started on December 17th. Yes, I remember that date, two o'clock in the morning on December 17th last year. Yeah, it's the gift that keeps on giving for sure. Oh, for sure. Yeah, no, I, I would say that many of us remember the day in December. Yes, yeah. yeah, definitely. So it's a, it's a great point actually about um, the communities um, how being like a self-organizing themselves. So I totally see that uh, some industries might be also looking how they self-organize. Um, it's it's pretty similar what was happening. Um, I'm just relying on my past experience in uh, in a social space, right? So when yeah. social data started exploding and people really didn't know how to manage, we didn't get any regulations from FDA, for example, right? Uh, but um, people started self-organizing by industry and saying like, what is my standard, right? So what, exactly. what we're going to be looking at. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And I think that's what government agent, I'm going to stop sharing here. I think that's what government agencies hope um, that um, industry will lead itself and correct itself. But, you know, time will tell, you know, as we move through this. Yes, absolutely. Um, thank you so much. Thank I you. Think we came to the end of the session. So Bas Paul, really much appreciated for joining us with such a productive discussion. So any um, last comment you want to make? Oh, no. Um, Thank you all for your time. Uh, Remember, hygiene is important. Uh, Keep testing. Paul, what are your thoughts? Just thank you very much for your time. Yeah. Thank you. Have a great day. Have a good day. See you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you.